Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We continue to celebrate our intellectual property. We team innovate for a green future. And this morning, we are so excited with our presenter that we have today. And it is only fitting to have someone who has so much years of experience and expertise today. No many persons have expected to be around here, Mr. Director. Also, also recognize our deputy director, Dr. Goss. With that said, let me just introduce to you today our presenter. Our presenter is Professor the Honorable Errol Morrison. Professor Errol, Professor the Honorable Errol Morrison, a OG, Jamaica's chief scientist, functioning as advisor to the Prime Minister and Director General of the National Commission on Science and Technology. As a biochemist, he has conducted extensive research on indigenous medical plants and potential therapeutic agents in diabetes, mellitus, and hypertension. This period of research spanned from 1979 to 1999 and yielded over 20 doctoral graduates supervised by him. As a physician, he has specialized in endocrinology and metabolic diseases and has carried out re region-wide studies in diabetes in the Caribbean. For this, he was awarded Queen's Gold Medal to the British Commonwealth for distinguished service to diabetes mellitus locally and internationally since 2006. Renowned for his philanthropy, research, and medical service, he was awarded the Gold Most Grave Medical Medal in 1998 and was honored by the government of Jamaica with the confirmation of the Order of Jamaica in 2001. His past appointments include Chair of the IDF North American and Caribbean Region since 1996 to 2002, and Pro Vice Chancellor of Graduate Studies at the University of the West Indies, 1999 to 2007, and President of the University of Technology Jamaica, 2007 to 2015. And he has written over 200 peer reviewed scientific publications. 20 books and technical reports. He's married with eight daughters and enjoys reading and public speaking. It's indeed a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, this morning to introduce you our speaker, Professor the Honorable Errol Morrison, who will take us in our discussion this morning on Innovate for a Green Future. Professor Morrison, over to you. Morning, Chantal. Good morning. Uh, Good to have you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that intensive introduction. And uh, a pleasant morning to all our participants. And as I've indicated, as I ramble on, I'd be happy to entertain any comments or questions which could clarify that which I would like to discuss. First of all, just let me congratulate Jai Po in putting on this kind of seminar. I think it is important, and there are a number of issues that I have with a, with a, with a concept like this. And um, I'm going to, you know, sway in and out of the various aspects of innovation. And first of all, you know, without attempting to to insult your intelligence. I, I, I just want to put on the table this whole matter of innovation. Innovation in the simplest term is going to refer to that introduction of something new or introduction of doing something old in a new way. And as such, there are a variety of ways in which this can come to the fore. Now, I come from a background of academia, where over the decades, we have been involved in research and attempting to bring new information out and to discuss this in the broadest uh, context with our fellow colleagues or with the public in general. Where that took me was an understanding that much of new thinking might really uh, reside within the intellectual foment that you get in institutions, 
you know of that level whether it be tertiary secondary or you know alternative whether in the private sector or or, or public sector or within academia of course which is where I saw now the point is that when I moved into the government sector and got involved with calling on the island to demonstrate what innovative activities were taking place I got a rude awakening because of the I would say this is since 2012 and of the several hundred innovations which have come in over this period I may shock you in telling you that 70% of these innovations are coming out of the man in the street so to speak not from within the R&D institutions you know not from the hallowed halls of research you know that you would have thought where new thinking would abide would, would, would abound but rather from the individuals out there in the workplace in the homes just observing and seeing where a situation could be improved by modifying it one way or the other in fact the story goes you know way back in the early 20th century when Ford was just developing its motor vehicle line and assembly lines were coming into being to roll out the production of the motor vehicles and the chief technocrats seemed to be befuddled by some aspect of the assembly line and they just couldn't come to an understanding as to how best to initiate it until Ford himself walking the floor you know met upon one of the cleaners and who in turn pointed out to Mr. Ford but this plug here is not fitting well because I see it dropping out on the floor from time to time when I clean and lo and behold that was a little cog in the system that was preventing the rollout I am just putting this on the table to point out that innovation in its broadest context can come from anywhere across what you may call the value chain those involved in productivity etc so it is that kind of broad based approach that I wanted to bring to our discussion this morning and whilst you know being pleased with that kind of of, of uh, outcome on the other hand let me paint a more realistic picture because for too long a number of our new thinkers those innovators in the broader sense have come up with inventions useful uh, inventions that can make a difference but which go nowhere and we wonder why is that we hear from certain quarters that these inventors are not presenting their discovery in a marketable way and hence they need to have uh, some training in how to market their, 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 their productions that's fine but even when we have put on and this is now how my my workshop there the National Commission gets involved you put on these seminars to help individuals to better present their their topics and so on that's where it ends because if you are thinking of focusing on our local setting that is local Jamaica or the Caribbean for that matter there is not much appetite amongst the private sector nor amongst the government to put that money at risk and I use the word risk because when you talk research and innovation there is no surety that it will really hit the commercial marketplace in a big way so you're putting funding you know into an investment 
in an innovation. And this is where the innovator has to become his or her own entrepreneur in the sense that believing in what they have introduced, they are now prepared to put their own financial uh, resources into that because we're not getting the support from private sector, nor from government. And you may say, but that is because these inventions do not bear directly on a problem which is being faced by a manufacturing company, for example, or a priority that the government may put on its tables that it wants to see more in agriculture this, or more in health this, or more in tourism this. And it is a pity that when some of these new inventions come upon the table, we are not able to see the spin-off, you know, in terms of where, you know, this could possibly go. And again, let me use one of our most celebrated examples. When now Thomas Philip Lecky, early in the 20th century, you know, was doing his genetic experiments with the cows, he was thinking of mainly getting more meat, getting more milk, and allowing the cows to, to live uh, more comfortably in the harsh, rocky, you know, dry, hot climate. When you consider most of these cattle, the dairy cattle and the beef cattle were coming out of Britain. And that is what was really in his headspace, as we understand it. But lo and behold, having developed that kind of, of a I see a message coming across. Is that, uh, you know, is there somebody who wanted to ask a question? No? Anyway, I'll continue. Lo and behold. Okay, okay, Marcus. Good. I'm, 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 I'm just rambling on. So, what, one of the things that came out of that is that from the innovation, you know, in creating this new cattle farm, okay? The seed from those bulls was able to demand a tremendously high price in the international marketplace. So it became an international product. And as such, was able to earn significant income for the country. So some of the simple, what may appear simple and localized innovations, taken at the helm and supported you know, could really mean a difference. And I, I think we ought to take seriously many of these new thinking and innovations that people bring to the table, some of which may not appear to us at first glance to have any major, you know, impact. But, you know, we need to be objective and to see in the broadest context what it is that is being brought to the table. Now, having said all of that, I want to just bring a few examples of what we have been seeing. Your focus is on green technology. So you're literally looking at innovations which could possibly mitigate against the adverse outcomes of environmental problems. You know, we're entering a hurricane season. How well are we uh, set and resilient enough to overcome any adverse outcomes there? We are in the midst of a health crisis. What is it that we are doing or could do um, that could reduce the impact of this, of this health crisis? And... It is a pity that it is crises which may have to literally push our problem-solving abilities. But there are some other areas which we have been sitting on for decades, in fact almost a century, and we have not attempted to exploit these in any serious way. 
as a prime minister some time back or it was a minister of agriculture, I can't remember which, at one of our Denby shows some years back was heard to say, why is it we are a country of samples? We bring out new thinking, we put out some new products and it goes no further than a sample. You know, and this is what I was alluding to earlier in terms of with a ghost, with, a, with, with, with your new product, right? There is no external funding. And if you yourself are not able to mobilize that, then heaven help you. So look, what are some of the areas that um, we could be looking at ex exploiting? And let me let me just use the environment as a as a start. You may be aware that I am chairman of the Scientific Research Council in Jamaica, and I think one of its major undertakings is to have been able to patent a wastewater system from the latter 90s, and which is now being employed in a variety of institutions in Jamaica, as well as in the wider Caribbean. And the principle there is to take waste, okay, that has a lot of organic content that could be, you know, easily broken down by bacteria, that to be put to work, right? And so they create what you call a biodigester, where the influent comes in full of all kinds of body fluid waste and that sort of thing, and bacteria will break it down so that the effluent is pretty much free from any potential uh, toxic waste. And uh, it could even be carried further through filters and could then be used for irrigation, for washing, a variety of things. And as one of my pool attendants mentioned to me once, he said, Prof, you see this water coming through this filter. It's cleaner than your NWC. Come drink some of it. Uh, well, well, the point I'm making is this biodigester you know, system introduced by the SRC is one of the hallmark introductions into new thinking and utilizing scientific knowledge to apply it to a problem. Because before this kind of system became available, you would find waste directly going into our, our, our sea coast. The result of that, as you will hear, is the pollution of the of the, of, of the neighboring seas, the breakdown of our, of our marine life and all that beautiful underwater ecosystem, you know, uh, undergoing dangerous uh, uh, breakdown and so on. So that was one area and it is, it is uh, one that seems to be taking the region by storm. It has you know, generated a number of international interests and so on. And properly built and properly managed is really an answer to an environmental problem. And I think SRC needs to be congratulated on that. And if JIPO is going to have any follow-up to this, in, it, in, its, in the 60th year of the SRC's existence, I think this is probably one of the most significant contributions it has made to Jamaica and the Caribbean. When we look also at some of what I would call the environmental uh, alternatives that we are struggling with as a small island nation, you know, we are surrounded by water that is in constant movement, and we have never taken seriously some of the inventions that have been brought forward to utilize what you could call wave motion energy, which is obvious. The sea never stops flowing. 
and the constant you know, motion from the wave can be converted into energy. And over the last four to six years, we have seen inventions coming forward that can use that wave technology. But there are no underlying support because when it is packaged and presented to, you know, potential or who you may call investors, it doesn't seem to capture, you know, the, the, uh, the imagination. And I guess if it is not being touted as the discovery of the new century, it doesn't take, it doesn't take hold. But I've seen this invention coming in over and over. It has been patented and it has even, uh, 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 a prototype has even been made in China and sent back for us. No takers. We have seen as well another individual looking at the combustion engine and saying, look, the cost of petrol in our small developing countries is prohibitive. How can we, you know, bypass or mitigate those high costs? And they introduced a mechanism of breaking water. Water, you know, H2O. Breaking it down with a simple aluminium mix, okay, and releasing hydrogen that's trapped you know, into the engine for creating the combustion energy. Control, because you may jump and say, hydrogen, that's it, atom bomb. No, 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 no. This is properly controlled and demonstrated locally. And it was even taken to the point where the inventor was recommended to get a prototype made and for, and a, 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 a private investor was prepared to even use some of his mobile fleet to test the use of this water as a source of energy in the combustion engine. But they even to make the prototype which would have cost the better part of you know maybe half a million US dollars, you know, uh there weren't any takers, nor could we uh get a a a, a finance strap government to put any money in that direction. So there again, our own intellectual property, which has created waves in the in the uh, social media and has gotten great responses out of North America and the Eastern you know, countries, yet nothing happening. But suddenly uh, we see a Japanese company coming up with the same idea years later. And we wonder, we can only wonder, you know, if, you know, our small, you could call him little backyard mechanic, literally, if that idea had not taken root elsewhere and been able to, to, um, to, to come to fruition. So that's another era that we're failing in. And uh, one or two that you might be familiar with, uh, during the water crisis, one of our own, again, at his home, can't get water to bathe. And he decided he would create a little system where he puts a little pan, maybe a gallon or two gallon pan, and attaches a little, you know, uh, air pump mechanism where it can be operated by the, by the foot. And that puts pressure in the water and sprays it up so it can become like a little standing water shower. And that is the sort of thing called a pump and spray mechanism which lucky for him, it managed to get into the North American market. And uh, we understand that he is on the way to doing well. I don't have any data. It's only a word of mouth that we've got. And another area, again, even as simple, those of you who are kitchen bound, if I may say so, and especially at a time of year, will want to use that well-known fruit called sorrel, which is used to make a popular drink, but which, as you know, has been studied by our local, one of our local universities and shown to have important anti-cancer properties, but more about that later. 
but just the simple process of peeling the soil, husking it, as you may say, from that seed. Okay, it is a, those of you who know, it is a real arduous little task doing that. And an inventor, local again, developed a machine that would strip the soil pretty quickly. And you may be aware that some of the largest soil producers are in China. And they have shown an interest in that little invention that's there. So, you know, there are some little bright spots, but we don't hear anything of it. You know, if a little company abroad might buy some and so on, the next thing you may hear, it utilizes the idea and explodes, and we in Jamaica get no, 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 no benefit out of it. And we can take that kind of reaction to another extreme. Those of you who may know of Man West, who invented the, the drops from uh, our cannabis preparation, he called it cannasol. It could be used in treating the pressure in the eye. The Canadians were looking at it and wanting to help to develop the product, but Manley kept it close to his chest. Refusing to expose it, well knowing that these, you know, more financially, you know, uh, resourced institutions could take his idea and run with it, and he would get not even the peanuts from that invention. So, on the other hand, him refusing to share, you know, that invention or innovation never came to anything much. And it floundered. A few persons might have used it, but it never reached the potential that that could have had, you know, especially in the 70s and 80s when it was at its most popular. So uh, there it is. We are uh, here bound with a lot of potential, but how we go forward with it, and I think it's important to recognize that there is a lot here that we could be utilizing in our, in our trust for new thinking. And I am sure it's not just invention for invention's sake, but for invention that could possibly take us into the, into the commercial marketplace. And not only in Jamaica, because to restrict yourself to the Grill and Moran point doesn't make much business sense. Okay, you're looking at an international marketplace. And one last thing I will say before I, I, I yield is we have been sitting on a gold mine for the last half a century and more and only giving lip service. And when we try to get the attention of whether private or public sector support, we get the thumbs down because they see it as push medicine. And therein lies the problem where we have no confidence in our own ability to be creative and to compete internationally. And until we get that kind of strength of ideas and fixity of purpose and a will, a resolve to make what we are doing, you know, competitive in the world market, we're not going to get anywhere. And I'm saying all of this because there it is. 50 years ago, when we started to introduce a variety of teas and extracts from our local plants, and even early then, the World Health was recognizing the fact that there are a number of plants that do have potential health benefit. And of those that they recognized, nearly 50% of them were to be found right here in Jamaica. And we never ever got off the ground. We made certain, you know, exhibitions every now and then. You hear, ah, the seriously, ah, the castor oil, ah, you know. But nothing, you know, serious has been done. And even our little uh, ram goat roses, the periwinkle, was taken away from us in the 60s and 70s and taken to Canada. We were using it to treat diabetes. But the Canadians found that that was not so effective. But lo and behold, they extracted an anti-cancer property from it, which is now used worldwide in the treating of blood cell cancers. Okay? 
a product called Vin Christian and Vin Lasting. These came from our simple periwinkle. And guess where it is that they are growing periwinkle now in thousands of acres, millions of acres, Madagascar. So Jamaica again has lost up. Forgive me. I get really emotional when I think of the potential that we have, yet the lack of support. You know, and one hand, you know, claps the other. Because with all the goodwill in the world, if we don't get that support, both even simple advice as well as some injection of, you know, fiscal resources, we're going nowhere. One or two other little, little, little things I just want to mention. You see this matter of honey. You know that our bees make in the logwood trees some of the finest honey in the world. That's another aspect of the nutraceutical to which I have been alluding when I spoke of the plants. And did you know that in 2015 our export of honey was no more than about 300,000 US dollars. A product that is in demand worldwide, a product that is recognized the logwood honey as amongst the best in the world, but getting no support. It's a, again, how did we know? Again, the innovation and studying the honey, looking at its properties and so on. You know, it's all here, but it's sitting there. It's sitting there. And I don't know how we're going to get our new thinkers to get up and get involved because they don't see it as viable. And 90 odd percent of these new ideas, which might move into a startup industry, never make it. So, whilst there are bright spots, there are an overwhelming negativity, you know in terms of the outlook. And it's important that JIPO is taking the position to encourage more and more of this, because who knows, something might emerge. But from my standpoint and my workload, we're, we're trying to push the nutraceutical industry. We're trying to push the scientific developments around control of environmental wastes where we're looking at a potential of alternative energy, uh, albeit with all the various, you know, new thinking, liquid, you know, gas as opposed to, you know, uh, the other fossil fuels there, um, and simple solutions in the domestic front, you know, which could take on and really make a difference in, you know, our life space. And I'm not just being altruistic now. I think if one has a good idea, he should try and make some income from it. Nothing wrong with that. Although a lot of us seem to feel that if we have an intellectual, you know, uh, uh, achievement, that's enough. It's not enough. You need to make some dollars too. And I think we need to be able to support, you know, our innovators in this way. I think I have rambled on in, enough. I have been looking to see if Bert, Bertland wanted me to stop or, or anybody wanted to comment, but I think I'll pause at that point. So yes, thanks very much for that. Um, you know, really breaking it down for us. You know the several aspects um, that we have perhaps worked on over the years, some have been accomplished and some, unfortunately, you know, we probably did not um, maximize the opportunities that we had, you know? So, um, I mean, I think 
And like how you started, you know, that the COVID crisis pushes um, problem solving abilities, you know, and, and forces persons to really think of how they can, um, in this period, uh, create some innovative ways to earn income. And of course, when we talk about IP rights, as you emphasize, it's very much about being able to commercialize your creativity. You know, because if you have these ideas, you have these inventions, and you're only tried and only known in your backyard, right? Then it really is not benefiting you or the wider society. So we have seen certainly at Jaipo um, and in the local space, you know, since COVID, a push um, into the COVID uh, invention. We've seen persons, um, Mr. Stewart from UTEP, we you know, had developed and has filed here at Jaipo application for Zermoso, which is the uh, product which cleans automatically the doors of uh, the door handles um, to have them germ free, you know, without having to touch it or wipe it periodically. And we've seen other you know, innovations too in terms of looking at the production of ventilators here in Jamaica, right? Um, and so we know that, that there's a lot happening. Uh, but I think sometimes, as you say, there are certain shortcomings in the ecosystem that aren't supportive enough of inventors and innovators, you know. Um, so I see a comment from Ms. Herlock. Uh, I hope you can see, Prof, that she has a feeling that Jamaica's healthy population will highlight nutraceuticals and natural remedies post COVID. And uh, I think that's a very re relevant point, Ms. Herlock, because as we've seen, you know, persons now who don't want to trust maybe eating out so much have been going back to their roots, going back to their herbs, back to their gardens, you know, and to grandma's remedies more. Um, but in terms of how we can maybe sustain industry out of this in post-COVID, I think is a very critical issue, you know, how to assess the resources that we have and to match those resources with the, the inventors and the innovators. Um, you know, who are working on these and who are intending to maybe bring them to market, you know. So I want to ask a question, Prof. Um, you discussed several environmental innovations, including the wastewater system from the SRC, right? And I know that you didn't really tell us whether you had tasted it or not, but it's okay, Prof. Um, we know it's, it, it's, it's clean and it works. But how I you also mentioned the wave motion energy, right? So as a small island developing state, how do you see that we could really maximize, as you said, this bounty of natural resources? We have the sunshine around us, right? We have the sea all around us. Um, I mean, persons are yearning for, you know, what we have here. Now with the travel restrictions, and of course, people may still not want to travel so much after this period. How can we you know, bottle maybe some of our tourism products and export it. I've always in my own mind asked myself, you know, how I can possibly um, bottle the sunshine and, you know, to export it. I would really like to, to know what is possible in that respect. But in a lawyer, I haven't been able to find a solution. But you no, know I'm saying we can't have all the million maybe coming or may not want to come to the, the sun, sea, and sand. How can we perhaps bottle some of what we have here to really have? A tourism export industry and a cultural natural remedies export industry in a post COVID era. I I I would like to answer you, but could I just mention uh, the, the the comment, the text that I saw flash up on the screen about the nutraceuticals, you know, as a as a as a way forward, you know, both within the COVID and the post-COVID. I saw that comment on the, on the screen. And I think, you know, the role of nutraceuticals is of particular interest here because we're talking about improving our resistance to viral attack. And it's not only just COVID-19, but we talk about, you know, the SARS-CoV-1 as well. And that is related to the H1N1 uh, influenza viruses. And we have the dengue viruses as well. All of these are there 
and they are seasonal and they keep coming in surges and when you start to look back over the centuries the different flus that are coming so what is upon us now is just one such and in another i hope not within my time but in another you know wave again you see more and what we're seeing more and more is the aging population turning more and more to the natural products and i must point out that these natural products do have a place in the what we can call the improvement of the immune response in the body to help us to ward off attacks by by the viruses and some of these immune responses are related to the content of our plants it's there's something about jamaica that puts us you know so highly ranked above our or what you will say obvious capacity because <clears throat> the potency of some of our, our natural products and again i begin to think of a ginger i begin to think of a cocoa i begin to think of a coffee you know things like these even our own um soil drinks and so on these carry an extra potency you know that seems to come from the ecology that is that is uh in there in the jamaican soil you know volcanic soil the 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 micro environment there and whatever micronutrients that may be there as well as our you know atmospheric condition something happens to give us you know this special place and you see why as you look at coffee you may think of coffee as a drink but it's a nutraceutical it's a highly important contributor of certain chemicals called xanthines that can help to protect the lungs especially in the asthmatics you know so you know there is uh, and as well as there are other aspects to it that will help to improve heart circulation and so on so there are so much to it we have seen uh, the blue mountain product in in, in one way we, i think jaipo is now even patented it geographically where it must exist although kenya has a blue mountain cafe too but i won't go down there the, the, the point i'm making is that the whole thrust in the direction of nutraceuticals is coming and if you look at the trend over the last several you know several decades the pharmaceutical industry that's the drugs that the big farm is making that has leveled off at about a trillion dollars a year business us dollars the nutraceuticals continues to rise exponentially and within the last 2 to 3 decades you have seen it move over a thousand fold in value as it is now just under you know a 600 you know billion industry and if taken and assessed properly you may well be seeing it close to the trillion and it is continuing to rise so we see it as one of the major aspects of the health industry from the point of view of therapeutics to come and so this whole thrust and we looking at the nutraceuticals in which jamaica is particularly rich and i've only mentioned just one or two year whole list of them you know we have an opportunity that we're missing and as i'm saying when you look at our sugar and our bananas and our bauxite and our moribund here is a new industry that is likely to take root and with the right support can take off anybody listening let me move to the next comment uh marcus you now spoke of the alternative energies and of course with the fossil fuel uh well the whole political uh back and forth and the swaying of the dollar uh the the cheaper way of of pushing oil out of the out of the earth's crust the fracking you know also brought prices down and now the natural gas is a very very important alternative and very cheap so you're going to to balance that now against the development of solar energy which i must tell you um 
we again have missed the bus. We don't see enough of that for us from way back in the 70s, 80s. A small country like Barbados was already giving, you know, uh, incentives for people to use their solar, you know, energy in heating, you know, their water supplies and so on. And with our constant and never-ending and sure supply of, 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 of sunlight, we should be doing more. We should be using this more extensively in our residential as well as our, our commercial, you know, areas. And that once, apart from the, 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 the cost of installations, it begins to pay dividends down the road. And we need to be long-term thinking. The other aspect of the wave, which is a little, again, not fully um, developed in or accepted here, but the technology is there and fully worked out. And we have non-ending waves. It never stops. You know, you may have night and day when the sun may disappear for a bit, but the waves never do. And another one, the wind energy. You know, whether we have enough wind, you know, speed across the island to drive enough, you know, Although they are now thinking that you know wind should be giving us nearly 30 percent of our energy supply, well, we'll see. But the point is, we need to turn more and more to these alternative energy sources, and we, you know, and until we are going to be putting you know dollars behind this, the people thinking in this in this way and who are prepared to even use external developments and and optimize them or adapt them for local conditions, they are not going to be stimulated to get into that area. And so a lot is going to need to be done to get our individuals to, to, to adapt and innovate on what is there because nothing is new under the sun. Somebody has thought of it. But how can we now adapt it to our own uh, our conditions is probably where the challenge is. So I, I, I take a point we should be looking more in those directions. There's a Significant cost, however, in this installation or the setting up of the thing. But once that gets going, it's easy, says to me. I don't know if that was a part of the point you were making, Marcus. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, boy, it, it really makes us wonder, um, you know, why we've not been able to to, to maximize the opportunities. Um, so, Ms. English, who is the one new copyright manager, um, very interested in your presentation and wanted to also to ask a question. Okay, so thank you, Prof. Excellent presentation. It was very interesting, and I love the energy that I'm getting from you. Uh, so my question is, uh, there are so many inventions. What would you say is the reason behind the lack of support and how can we bridge this gap? We know we're, we're moving into having you know, experienced COVID-19, all this crisis. We want to make a you know, change for the future. How can we not repeat this experience, some of the things that you shared with us? Uh, so what would you say is the major reason for the lack of support to these inventors? People don't like me, you know, because I speak the truth. <laughs> and a significant part of our problem is our lack of appreciation of knowledge. Let me put it that way. Because when you look at our knowledge base, we may have that which is delivered to us you know, in a classroom setting. Uh, we may have new knowledge which is delivered to us by the result of some investigation and some research and development institution. But by far, the broadest canopy of knowledge is our cultural experience, which has been handed down to us from generation to generation. And guess what? That is what we neglect. That is what we taboo. That is what we shun and say, oh, old wives sales, granny business, you know, uh, dark ages, bush. That is our problem. Our lack 
of belief in ourselves, which is literally a lack of self-respect, you know. People don't like to hear that. But what we call cultural science is the bedrock, right, of our development. And when we take aspects of these now to develop them, to work on them, to use one little area or the other, to bring it forward, it takes a Herculean task to overcome just the mindset of the people in the private sector, of the people in the government sector, and of our own people around us. So until we have developed that confidence, you, you remember those words from Marcus Garvey? The man was on the ball, you know, nearly a century ago, and is still one of the problems that we have. I read an interesting internet discussion recently where they were looking at the possibility that our travail and sojourn in the centuries of slavery caused a certain adaptation in our genetic makeup that has created that continued uncertainty about ourselves. I'm using language as best as I can before Chantal and Bertland cut me off. <laughs> we, we, we have no belief in ourselves. And until we are prepared to say, yes, here is something, let us study this, let us take this, you know, to the international arena. Until we are prepared to do that, I think that is one of the greatest obstacles, Chantal, in our trying to bring our, our, our products forward. And you see, it's one thing to do this, you know, no man is an island. He or she needs the support of those around him. But those around him are full of skepticism, disbelief, and not wanting to accept what they see as folklore or a Nancy business. Or as. So until we can shake those fetters off and begin to look at ourselves and to see, you know, what is possible. You know, I met a fellow the other day who told me he used to do a thriving business in selling breadfruit leaves to England. Breadfruit leaves because they saw a beauty in the leaf that they wanted to use in a variety of, you know, uh, what you call it, environmental settings and all your prepare halls and all of that kind of furnishings and so on. Something that we throw away and, you know, chop brush it. But the point is, until we begin to look at the potential value, and there are going to be a few of us who every now and then will find some potential value and want to study. But because of the surrounding uh, objective or negative, you know, vibes, they may not want to take it forward. And therefore, that is why we in government you know, through the NCST you now and the Ministry of Science and Technology, we have been calling for people to come forward. Tell us what you're doing. And we recognize that some of them may be hesitant, so we say, look, talk first with JIPO. Let them register your product, that this is your idea. So when you bring it into the public domain, nobody can steal it of such, you know, because you would have been so registered. And we've been calling for New and new ideas, and it's amazing, you know, what is, is there? I mean, Marcus mentioned some of the health related things, a new fellow, you know, doing his um, doorknob things and the heart machine that was developed with UTEC and UA and all this sort of thing. And you, you, you saw Dr. Dawes talking about salt mass and all that. These are all ideas, some of which may not, you know, have strong scientific support. But nonetheless, you know, a lot of what is out there in the marketplace is just based on cultural belief, you know. You have grown up on cod liver oil. You have grown up on cow's milk. What is the value in those things? Do they really give you strong bones? Do they really help you to grow? It's a marketing strategy that you have been exposed to and you believe in and you practice. So in the same way that we have a cultural you know, scientific body of knowledge based on practice, 
from generation to generation. These are some of the things, Marcus, that Jaipur should be having a, a, a project. It really pulling out from the people that which they do and begin to see what may be an area of prioritizing for further study, etc. So these are the kinds of thinking that I that I have been entertaining as to what we really need to do to begin to get our own understanding, our own knowledge on the front burners. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Um, so, yes, I think that definitely, you know, in terms of our own work, um, Jaipur in relation to the protection of traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions, we see that, you know, it's some of those same challenges that we have in terms of, you know, persons appreciating and accepting, you know, these uh, aspects of knowledge and of creativity and of culture, you know, because, of course, our, our Experiences historically, we have, as you said, been taught to um, not appreciate those things that are of us, you know, and so we have that challenge as well. Um, as you may know, Prof, we are currently working on um, the process to develop a national law legislation to protect traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions, pr primarily for the purpose of being able to have cultural practitioners, cultural bureaus, communities. Those persons who are preserving these aspects and working in them, having the incentives as other IP creators do, um, to have legal protection, you know, for works for creativity that is of a traditional nature. So hopefully that will, um, you know, be able to bring forth more certainty, you know, um, and importantly more investment. I also want to point out too, in terms of what's already existing out there um, at present, you know, even though we know there's a, a far away to go further, but certainly um, at Jaipur we have uh, recently just passed in Parliament a new Patent and Designs uh, Act, a new law that will be enforced later this year that will have a new modern patent regime in place here in Jamaica, you know, that will be on par with other countries so we will be able to have an international system in place, international patent registrations and design registrations permissible here, thereafter. And so we are creating the platform, the legal platform, for persons to be able to protect their creativity and their innovations legally. You know, um, we also are doing a fair amount of work in terms of trying to enhance access to finance, because we recognize that that's a major problem. To what you say, for the persons don't necessarily see the, the the reason to invest in what they don't believe in, but um, by virtue of a project we're currently engaged in with uh, the IDB and the CDB. We are working to create a framework for IP valuation and for IP collateralization so that person would be able to, in the near future, take their inventions, their ideas, their innovations to a financial institution. And on the strength of that, uh, you know, um, that invention gets a loan, you know, secure some financing to be able to grow and to commercialize their ideas. You know, bring them to the market. Um, all of this we see as part of the, the ecosystem that we know needs to be developed so that inventors have some support, you know, uh, to be able to commercialize and profit from and make more inventions. Um, I also want to point out that there is a platform that WIPO provides called WIPO Green, right? WIPO Green. So persons can always Google and check it out. Where Inventors and innovators are able to go on the web platform and to upload your, well, uh, this kind of brief description of your idea or your area and to match it with persons who may want or are seeking that kind of innovation, you know, um, to be able to match investors, match maybe some licensees. So helping persons to match the creativity with, again, the, the financing, um, you know, to create an ecosystem that can help to spur further creations. And we're also looking at developing a WIPO, in a, um, a WIPO Inventors Assistance Program, where WIPO has again uh, created a platform for persons who need help in terms of being able to draft patent applications that help from, from lawyers um, at the pro bono or for a reduced fee. What we found at JIPO is that persons from the, the diaspora are always willing, we find, to help 
we got calls from the UK, from the US, from Canada, from persons who are medical doctors, they're scientists, they're patent owners and patent agents over there. And they're always saying that they are willing to assist and give uh, free work or you know, reasonably affordable work um, for persons from the Caribbean who want to protect their inventions. And so again, I think if we make the proper connections, we're able um, you know, to hopefully get access to resources, to assistance, to financing that can help us. And uh, lastly, Wipotisk. Wipotisk, we have a Jipotisk network right now in place where we have institutions like UB, UTEC, um, we're working with UCC, NCU, and Manley, Michael, and others to have a center at these locations where persons, staff, students, and the public can go and get help to research global databases about IP and patents. So they can also be informed to improve the quality of the local inventions that are coming out. You know, so there's a lot happening. You know, DBJ also is working on some financing for the creative sector, for inventions, for patentees, or for the applicants as well. So there is stuff happening. But again, I think if we can put it in a kind of map and help to steer persons in the various directions, we will hopefully be able to see some progress. Prof, I want to ask about the policy. I know that there have been some work on the um, National Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy. Um, I, I'm not sure if it had reached the, the point of, of, of finalization. As Could you say a bit about that, perhaps? Yeah. Um, before, I see a question on the screen, which would probably be your domain. How can Jamaican innovators secure oh, when well, there I'm is no institutional just secure public protection when there is no institutional. I'm not sure if that's going the legal framework. I'm not sure, but um, so yes. Yeah, so my question, my my input was geared to helping to show that there is some legal framework in place. There is some financial assistance in place, um, and there is um, you know some help in terms of legal help as well. But there is a need, I think, for more um, for more legal skills, more expertise, more innovation, and certainly more commercial opportunities. You know, but I would love to hear your, your, your answer as well, Prof. Yeah. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm happy to report that it was from 2015, the National Commission on Science and Technology was given the mandate to develop a national policy on science and technology. And, you know, one of the members of the Board of Commissioners, you know, was requested to lead that, supported by the NCST where I sit. And we have doggedly, you know, been pursuing this. And it has reached the stage where we submitted a draft which was discussed in Parliament and which came back to us with, with requests for some fine tunings and which will now require what you call wider wider uh, public consultation with stakeholders across the country before we can get it into you know the gazetted format you know you have white paper green paper whatever to bring it in but let us let us put a few things on the table because why is it is under this kind of consideration I'm told that it is highly confidential you know, but at the same time, there are some broad areas which I think, you know, our policymakers have been saying in the public over and over. And I think I can bring this to, you know, our conscience at this point in terms of priorities. Or we have been talking about it. agriculture. How can we improve our, our agricultural, you know, inputs and outputs? you know, that can make our country self-sustaining as well as, you know, able to even export excess crops. And, uh, you know, commenting on it even now, COVID-19 is showing us that we should be using more and more of our own produce. And if we can do that, then, you know, we should be more self-reliant. Uh, and it goes back, these are the kinds of things being said in all different kinds of ways. Eat what you grow, grow what you eat, and all those other things. But this is a priority area: agriculture in, you know, in its greater productivity, and agriculture in protecting our our our, our produce. 
from infestation and so on. And as we say, infestation and all sorts of that come to the evil health. Because you would have heard that um, there are new uh, thrusts to reduce the whole insect population. You know, mosquitoes carry most of our 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 uh, in infected conditions. And if we can introduce a methodology to reduce the mosquito population, which, as you know, within three months can give you, you know, nearly a billion of them just the way in which they multiply. So they, that is a species that we can hardly, you know, um, successfully overcome. But there may be some scientific and technological introduction now that can create a problem in how they reproduce. And I will, I won't say more of that, but that is one of the priorities that we're looking at. Then, of course, you know, we want the, uh, another priority that has been been given to us to to to, to look at is to how we can get the population in general to understand the role of s and science and technology, in any national development. And the part and parcel of that is how we're going to teach our young, because you need to start exposing them to an understanding of their environment, which is the scientific knowledge and scientific base that we need to put in place from the pre school areas, uh, pre-school, you know, levels. That whole STEM, you know, popularization, as we call it, you know, is key to getting our people to understand the rule. And you see, what I'm trying to point out when we say STEM, you know, people think of science and you start thinking of the laboratory and so on. No. That science that I am interested in and that we all should be interested in, is that knowledge that we have, that intrinsic knowledge that we are failing to use. Look at it this way. Almost all of our new inventions, you know, have been simply a more modern day endorsement by using our new phone technology to prove or disprove what has been practiced for centuries. You know. So it's not that there is anything new. There are new ways of trying to justify the use of much of what has been there for centuries. So we want a broader understanding of our young people as to the role of, you know, we say science and technology. And if I again may just define it in the simplest way, science and knowledge, technology, how you use it. I don't know why they specifically say engineering. I guess the engineers feel special. But engineering is just one aspect of technology. You know, applied scientific knowledge. And maths, they call it maths, but it's simply measurement. If you can't measure what you're doing, then you don't know what you do. There must be some way in assessing what you do. So while STEM is a nice, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Acronym, okay? It is just talking to knowledge and its use. And we need to get our young people to understand. And when you start talking about you know, our discoveries and our laboratories and so on. And you're looking at where the first world is. I have some verbal violence in my office as I sit with staff and we discuss this kind of thing. Because I'm saying, look, what you see happening in, say, North America and Europe is the result of 200 plus years of people going into the field. Let us use agriculture as an example. And looking at what the farmers do, the so-called scientists rolling up their sleeves and working side by side with the farmers in the field, what it is that is allowing this to do better or that to do better, and studying what is going on, and then taking those results and concepts into the lab to verify it. It is years. Now we can't come with our lack of resources, financial, equipment, and even limited, you know, uh, scientific understanding when you look at the broad context of bringing, you know, what you would call the critical mass of minds together. We have all of that limitation and suddenly we want to be world leaders in all kinds of scientific endeavor. Poppycock! It can be done. So we need to take some of our fundamental, you know, uh, 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 measures, that which we know about, that which we have at our, at our own fingertips, 
that which we can now study here. Bring the diaspora here. Don't tell me about sending this thing up to them. No, they must come here and study it in the context of our own cultural existence. That is how we're going to move forward, you know. We cannot simply lift hundreds of years of experimentation in North America and Europe and elsewhere and bring it into Jamaica overnight, okay, and expect to get some tremendous outpouring. It's not going to happen. So let us get realistic. What is on the ground that we can do? There's some nice ideas and we have touched upon them. But again, I come to my beating stick. We have at our fingertips things that can make a difference, create a new industry, develop the thing, and nobody's listening. What the hell is he for him? <laughs> what, is, what is happening? Why is it? You know, we just can't take hold of our own knowledge base. Okay? That little bit in that little microcosm of scientific endeavor worldwide, what it is we have the advantage on. And as a politician once said, run with that strength. That is what we need to do. And that is where the whole STEM thing, I believe, is where it should be going. And what we're trying to do as well as part of the popularization is to train the trainers how best to expose our young to an understanding of science and ecology and so on. You know, I don't even know if children anymore put a little red pea in a bottle with some blotting paper that is down and watch the thing sprout. You know, the stem going up, the root going down. I don't know if they do these things anymore, but these are some of the basic things that get young people interested and want to understand what is happening. All right? And, and they can begin to study it and all that might be more relevant to our own era. So agriculture, health, you know, education, especially in the sciences, because that is where we feel that, you know, way in which you focus your mind and try to verify hypotheses, that's the best way in going forward, evidence-based, as you would say. And then there is, you know, our main source of income, our tourism industry, facing serious challenges at this time, you know, it cuts across everything we do. The agricultural support, you see it. You've been watching the news and all those who you, you know, supply to the industry. You know, they are now, you know, critically, you know, uh, impacted. The, 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 the health, well, you know, COVID speaks to that right away and it will impact upon the tourist industry. You know, the education, the quality of the minds of the people that we have. They are importing people from everywhere else to come and serve, whilst our own locals are not getting that opportunity. And if they do, they are being paid at lesser levels. Oh, that sort of thing must stop. But it will only come until we get some good education in place. And those are some of the main thrusts in the, in the, uh, in the national policy that's coming. And we're just in the process of getting some national you know, consultations going and so on. But one of the things I, I think I want to just put in here at this point, and I see where Professor Rosalia Hamilton lit a fire, you know, by talking about don't reopen the economy, restructure it. And I think she's onto something there. Because this is what I'm going on and on and on about and getting my blood pressure up. I don't know why. <laughs> because, you know, because <laughs> I'll be dead on girl and nothing would have changed much. But, here an important COVID and post-COVID source that I think we ought to be looking at. The advent of the fourth industrial revolution brings us wireless technology and the internet. Through this, and experiments have been shown in India and Bangladesh that young people, very young, can be taught through the wireless technology, even the use of the mobile te telephony, the, the mobile phones. What I'm trying to get at, we need to give our people the best possible education that can come. And with the advent of the wireless technology, and now we're getting our wireless, you know, and internet 
into the hinterland, you know, areas that are hard to access by road. We can get to them, you know, by the airways. We can get a proper and better, you know, education to our people, emphasizing this whole science and technology, emphasizing that they need to use the little information they have to do things, not just to get an education to go and look for work, but to get an education that you can use it in your own right to create opportunity, entrepreneurship as they talk about. We need to get this across. You know, small business, small startups, that is the anchor, the core of development in any of the first words. And until we are going to get our young people to manage that information, and I think the scientific, you know, technological approach is going to be the key. Get the information to them and encourage them to use this as to how best they can see an opportunity for themselves. Not just training them to go work for whoever and whoever, but to look at their own opportunities. When we can begin to get that together, I think we are on our way. So that mass education of a proper first class level, I think is fundamental to our education. And no matter what, you know, thrust we're going to have, until that is put in place, we're not going anywhere. You know, so the priorities are there. We should be, God willing, um, be able to have the final policy together and back to cabinet and parliament, hopefully by the end of this year. So come 2021, there may be some guide for the population at large as to the priorities that the government sees that s and you know, can, can, can bring to the people and the country's developmental process. Um, so, Bernard has a question um, that he's gonna put to you, seeking your, your guidance. Yes, good, after, good, after, good morning, Professor Morris, and thank you again for that um, sage level presentation. Really learned a lot, I must say. And um, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I, I'm hearing you. Okay, great. I was just asking if, if, um, if there was a way for us to reduce the hurricane impact problem to a problem that was already biding to by um, capitalists, say, for example, the, the Ford assembly line problem, if we were able to reduce the hurricane impact problem to a problem that was already buy into by capitalists, then maybe they would be able to spend some funds on that. And when I say reduce, I mean, for example, the hurricane impact problem, it has various outcomes that we could map onto various outcomes of successful prob problems that have been solved already. For example, the assembly line problem, we we'll map those on and then we could um, get persons to buy into it to show them that even though it's a very hard problem to solve, solving this problem is going to be very beneficial in the long run, similar to the assembly line where everybody has a car now. So I was thinking um, along that line, if we could reduce the problem to something else. I, 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 I love it. And remember now, as you use hurricane as a special focus, Jamaica has a good track record here in terms of, you know, developing its building code to ensure that we can withstand the buffeting of the winds, okay, and to have proper roofings in place to even protect against, you know, the winds and the rain and so on. So our building code, which I think has come into uh, law, I think, if I'm not mistaken, recently, is going to help to protect us there. Also, the government is pointing out that there are areas in which you shall not build, you know, on bank sites, gully banks, and, and you know, too near to the seacoast, things like those. Um, 
uh, these are important infrastructural uh, things being put in place. But look at what we could do now. Because if you may be too young, based on your voice, to remember um, uh, a Gilbert 32 years ago. But even so, you have seen winds and rain that have knocked out our, 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 our lighting source and so on, the JPS supply. If we were looking seriously at putting in, you know, the, the solar power that can, you know, drive the power needs of our residences and, you know, business places, the impact of the loss of that kind of power supply would be much mitigated. So, you know, we're looking at utilizing that which we have at our fingertips in a more significant way. Of course, as you begin to do this, there's a balance in terms of investments and jobs and so on. But there is always some compromise that can be worked. And these are the kinds of things that we want to see. In, you know, and, and in terms of how we are seeing the potential, again, just using your hurricane example, and you, you know, farmlands are devastated and so on. The fruit production, fruit, right, as opposed to food production, both, you know, would be laid waste for quite a while. And we should be seeing more and more of our local industries, you know, uh, what shall we say, taking, you know, uh, our, our production at the harvest and, and packaging and preserving, you know, uh, the excess that is not used or, 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 or exported and utilize, you know, stored and that can be brought out in times of need like this. These are some of all the contingencies that we should be able to put in place to mitigate the effects of, 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 of adverse uh, disaster situations like a hurricane. Just thinking of, 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 of some of these as you're talking aloud. Yes, Prof. Um, I think that there's a lot that you have touched on, you know, there's so much for thought, you know. Um, I think one of the things that we see is sometimes, is, as you say, you know, when people think of science or technology, you know, in terms of maybe in Jamaica, then there is a sense sometimes of intimidation, you know, in terms of that it's so difficult, it's so complex, you know, um, and so persons tend to shy away from it and we see you know, where there is a push to, to uh, emphasize science and technology in schools among young persons in the school curriculum. So I'm very glad to hear that the policy you know, come to um, fruition uh, this year or early next year. I think it's been very good for us to have a focused approach that we can then you know, refer other uh, MDAs too, as well as the private sector to look at how the policy can be implemented, how it has maybe some incentives and you know, you know, to be able to spur um, on you know the investment and the focus on science and technology and innovation that we need. You know, I think it's very important. If you look at the issue of you know the countries of the world and their development, you see how there's a symbiosis with development and the increase in science and technology, the increase in the number of patents being registered, for example, you know, um, and we see how as countries try to amass more influence and more authority and more wealth, they definitely focus on that aspect. Because of course, the more patents you have and the more patents that you can have be licensed outside of your country, right, is of course the more revenue you have coming into the country. Of course, it is a indicator of the, the, the country's development and progress and that kind of thing. So we're definitely looking forward to that policy um, to see how we can use it to, to, to be able to, to spur innovation in the country. Um, I want you just to ask if there are any questions then from Marcus, our, Marcus, our, see we have another Marcus, question. Before you, before you. Encouraged composting at the domestic level, can the NSWMA work with Ministry of Agriculture I believe, look at urban agriculture in the inner cities. That's from Ms. Paula Herlock. 
That's what you want. That is, that is, you know, very, very, very important in the way in which we can do what you could call recycling in one way or the other. Um, I have had opportunities to see proposals come across my desk where people are looking at even, you know, the waste tires that have been abandoned not only in Riverton City, but across the dumps and the highways and byways across the country. And they see enough potential there to utilize these in a variety of, 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 of ways. Um, uh, again, when you speak of the composting, uh, whether it is going to be a little cottage industry where individuals will do that in their backyards, or whether you're going to get a major you know, developmental for us to put something together and then to be able to sell, you know, even locally, if not externally. Uh, why not? I think this, these are areas that should be looked at. And um, I, it, it is well worth the, the, the support of, of uh, well, uh, you know, the private sector who would have, you know, more of the investing funding. Because right now, you would have heard, you know, that the government wants to put aside some money for R&D, research and development, which would be a first in terms of anything significant. And until that is available, you know, unless it becomes a priority within one of the ministerial portfolios, you might not find this sort of thing taking, taking root. But the point is, well, taking Ministry of Local Government is is some is 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 a kind of of um approach that would need to be taken here, but you know you see when you have ideas like these until you really begin to show that it will work, so a little bit of what you would call precipitating factor to show yes this is viable it can work before you find as Oscar Wilde says that your success means more success. And more and more people want to come and join you in that in that thrust. So we all know about composting and the opportunity it is. But again, nobody has really taken it to you know a real commercial level. And that is well worth you know con considering. But I wanted also just to mention, as I heard Marcus talking about the patenting, and to remind us that. It's not too long ago, you know, the government literally, you know, passed a law that ideas could be patented and used as collateral for obtaining funding support for projects and so on. But I don't think that has ever been taken up. And I have a number of, of, of contacts who have developed and patented certain processes here in Jamaica, and the banks will not even open their doors to listen to these proposals. And it is abroad that they had to go to get, you know, funding using that patented idea, you know, as a collateral. Again, this is where, uh, you know, investment will come, or people seeing an opportunity, how you present it. But locally, uh, until we can really, you know, feel that we can go places with this idea. I don't know, Marcus, how well you're doing with getting the financial sector to listen to the fact that uh, a good idea is a bankable one. Yes, sir. Um I think that you know the the um, practices that we each can do, you know, to to make a difference is important. I like this product's question in terms of composting because oftentimes persons do care and do want to do something, but aren't sure what to do. You know, um, I watched a documentary recently about the issue of how the public gets involved in recycling sometimes, and how sometimes. If it's not properly structured, you know, it may not be as helpful as it can 
be because persons don't know what to do or where to go or to take what. And you know, we have this issue um, where persons want to do the right thing but don't necessarily know how or maybe it's too difficult, you know, to do so. So I wonder if you had any more thoughts in terms of, of what other kinds of things you know the average Jamaican um, could do in his or her daily life, you know, to, to help the 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 environmental protection cause. You know, so you, you, you're not asking me to come on. You're putting it out for any comments and questions. Well, what I was saying, since you it's a way with the platform, I was trying to follow up yeah, to say so, other yeah. kinds of things, like recycling, for example, I know is very typical, right? And persons want to do it, but maybe there are, there's some other things too as well. You know, right now, with the straws, with the balance straws we've seen recently, right? We've seen how, you know, sometimes the law can have so much power and effect. It's just a simple proclamation, you know, that we see no more straws, we see no more single use plastic bags, people have to come out to adjust to that in a fairly short period of time. And something that we thought probably we'd never see has happened practically overnight. You know, so maybe some more focus on that kind of thing that what can the average householder do, you know, to help us to save our um our environment or Jamaica. Any thoughts? You you mentioned straws. You mentioned straws, and I immediately remember when there was a possibility of looking at creating, of, of making chopsticks using our bamboo. There was a big, you know, to do about that, and the billions of chopsticks that would be ordered for our bamboo industry. Nine day talk. We haven't heard, and this is an opportunity to get the bamboo industry going, you know, again, innovative ways in using bamboo in way in which it is using the furniture. You see, the Chinese use the bamboo in their scaffolding and so on. And, you know, we have it here wasting along the hillsides and so on. We haven't utilized that opportunity, which could have begun an industry, which I heard mentioned in some quarters. It was in the media and so on. But no stick further. What has happened? You know, I don't know if it came to Jaipo for registration and you would be able to tell us where these bright ideas go, but somehow they just fritter away. And this is what we want to harness to get our new thinkers, you know, to really begin to get on a track as to make, to pursue and to persist with their ideas. You know, to take it as far as possible into the marketable sphere. Thanks, Thank you very much, bro. Um, yes, I think that we've, we've, we've talked about a lot and a lot more to think of. This is, of course, the first in our series, so um, <laughs> we will be having more in terms of the topics for discussion that relate to our theme, you know, in terms of how we can innovate for a greener future. Um, did you say the question, Mr. Wong? Yeah. Right. So the question again from Ms. Herlock. The comment, I think unless re recycling is monetized, it won't take root. I thought about composting nationally. They have seen persons purchasing thousands of thoughts of composting soil, possibly creating employment. Prof, I see you shaking your head. Absolutely. I, I agree with her 100%. Because, uh, you know, as we say, I know the same, don't yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what she is recommending is a real national industry. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of feedback. On a, and to do it on a, on a level where we can scale up to really make it a worthwhile industry which would uh, require the input of machinery, etc. It would result in jobs and, you know, or distribution. So we are now probably importing that for people to buy, to take and put, you know, in their various regards. But we could be doing it, you know. Uh, we, we have heard of them creating little briquettes, you know, small wooden chips of some of our well-known plants, the Lucaina and so on, the late... Most Honorable Edward Siaga used to be, you know, fervent on the opportunity of using that looping, you know, in a variety of ways. 
creating little brickets that can be used to, to burn, whether domestically, you know, or or in or industrially, because it created a lot of heat when it burned as well. But nothing of this sort has ever taken on, you know, and these are alternatives that, you know, have floated around, but nobody has taken the thing seriously. And I think Paul is onto something there in terms of pushing for a national composting industry. I think it is feasible, it is doable, you know, if you can get someone to invest in, in that way. That means they need to get into the NSWMA and, you know, be able to collect, you know, much of all of that refuse that is being collected to sort it out, you know, as to uh, what will be required for the Ziga to, to channel it there. It's all an industry that can be done. Um, I, I guess you just have to stimulate some ideas there. You know, that's what a seminar like this is about. So some of us should take away these kinds of ideas, ruminate on it, think up a business plan, you know, and put on sometimes you're starting small, but the thing can explode, especially if it can be seen to be sustainable and can generate a significant profitability. That's what, you know, investors want, you know, what's in it for them? They must be able to see a turnover of their, of their income. But that is a very doable thing because several times I've heard individuals, again, speak to what you call waste to energy. You're talking composting. But there's another aspect called waste to energy. And they feel that the waste that is being generated in this country is enough to create a sustainable, you know, industry. So, you know, the composting may be just another one that could very well, you know, benefit and be sustained from the generation of our waste. I think Paul is on to something there. Um, Thank you very much. Um, Paul is agreeing with you that our markets alone, you know, produce so much organic waste that is being wasted, you know. Um, so, as you say, there's so much. I mean, people from overseas always come and say, well, Jamaica has so much, you know, and can't understand why we're still where we are, you know. But um, I think that if we focus, you know, on some of these, as you say, Prof, you know, this kind of discussion is fertile ground for a business plan, you know, some kind of environmental business, and we do need more of those. And if you look at funding that's available now, you know, to the Caribbean and Latin America oftentimes, there's a lot of funding for, for green energy, for environmental products, for climate change adaptation projects and businesses, you know. A lot of funding out there because of this whole focus now globally on climate change and, of course, the particular vulnerability of small island developing states as we are, you know, so a lot of money is out there and persons were to tailor their businesses to cater to some of these needs and problems. I think they'll be able to find ready uh, investors or funding available platforms for their ideas. You know? um, any more questions from the public, Mr. Lowe? I don't see any more questions, sir. All right. Um, Prof, we've heard a lot from you this um, Morning, we're commenting that you know because of the of the social distancing and the webinar, we're actually able to offer you a glass of dry water you know, <laughs> remotely. So as you know, we've, we've had you talk a lot this morning. So I'm going to pass over to Shantal as I give the vote of thanks. Um, but my want to thank you very much, Prof. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, very excellent presentation. We're happy that you were able to join us this morning. I'm sure our participants they have. You yeah, agree with me that it was very excellent. This discussion was very, very extensive, and we really appreciate this, this depth and wealth of knowledge that you were able to offer us this morning. And particularly, want to point out your emphasis on science and technology, and for us to begin at the primary level where we can reach our young person. So, at the time they reach a certain level, they already have this knowledge and you know this interest to want to assist and to want to to be involved in, in more inventions and you know, possibly greater ideas in terms of how to reach out to some of the private um, sectors as well as governments and how to pitch ideas for them to accept these things. So it was a beautiful presentation. And also I liked when you pointed out the, the need for us to appreciate, appreciate each other and the depth of knowledge that Jamaica has in our cultural experience and how we can use that to advance ourselves if it is that we just believe in ourselves and the knowledge that we have. So again, I want to say thank you so much on behalf of our director, executive director, Ms. Lizzie Kerberoni, and our deputy director, Dr. Marcus Scott. I want to thank you so much, and the driver staff, I want to thank you so much 
for coming for doing the presentation this morning. It was it was excellent, superb. It was very interactive, you know, it was just real and we really appreciate it. And we would love to have you do another presentation for us in the near future. Because I really enjoyed it, really enjoyed it, and really appreciate it. And for our participants, just want to let you know that next week, Thursday at 10 o'clock, we'll be having Mrs. Lalita Davis Mattis, and she'll be talking about intellectual property and the environment. And that's also expecting to be an excellent discussion. So again, we say thank you very much, Prof. And you can feel free to join us next week again and uh, in that presentation. So thank you so much, and thank you so much, participants. And we hope to, to see you again next week on our live discussion. Thank you. Okay, no, okay. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again. Okay, Doke. No. All right, good. good. We, we have a poll for our, our, our first buttons so you can answer the questions that you know. Oh, okay. Um, I think we're finished now, no? Please, 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 um, and you can call us, of course, on our numbers 876 946-0789, And of course, um, we are here in office to answer the questions and to use our advice and guidance as well to protect and commercialize IP rights. So, thank you very much. I think we're off. Thanks. Everybody.